Meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, ich begrüße Sie sehr herzlich heute zu diesem Vortrag zu Oppenheimer. Ich begrüße ganz besonders den heutigen Vortragenden, Ray Monk. I would like to welcome you and thank you very much for giving us the lecture today. Ich möchte kurz erläutern, dass dieser Vortrag, wie Sie der Einladung entnehmen, äh, gemeinsam äh, mit, der, mit einer neu gegründeten Initiative, Wittgenstein-Initiative, äh, 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 veranstaltet wird. Äh, von der Wittgenstein-Initiative sind wir zwei Kollegen besonders gut bekannt, die ich äh, hier, hier begrüßen möchte, das ist John Seiler und Friedrich Stadler. Ich finde es sehr schön, dass es in Österreich oder in Wien eine solche Initiative, Initiative gibt und man wundert sich, warum es nicht schon früher so was, aber das ist oft so bei solchen Initiativen, warum es früher nicht schon früher so etwas gab. Es wird Sie wundern, warum wie die Verbindung von Wittgenstein zur heutigen Veranstaltung ist. Es ist eine hochinteressante, and from now on I would like to continue in English by introducing our speaker tonight. Ray Monk is a British philosopher. He is a professor of philosophy at the University of Southampton where he has talked since 1992. He won the John Levelin Rice Prize and the 1991 Duff Cooper Prize for Ludwig Wittgenstein, The Duty of Genius. And we had some discussions yesterday about analytic philosophy and, and where new concepts come from and so on. It was quite, quite uh, interesting for me. His interests lie in the philosophy of mathematics, the history of analytic philosophy, and philosophical aspects of biographical writing. And he has recently booked, uh, 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 published the biography of Robert Opp Oppenheimer, which is the cause for today's uh, invitation. As you all know, I'm a physicist and I used to work in nuclear physics a long time ago. And I should mention that I, I even taught uh, many, uh, many years ago, starting at the University of Vienna and also at other universities, uh, 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 courses on, on, on uh, nuclear fission, which included uh, the basic knowledge which I think physicists should know about nuclear weapons, which was actually not so easy to, to start this at that time. There was some resistance, but my, uh, but uh, you know, it's, it's all publicly available information. I think people should know this and people should also know, know the, uh, the, the consequences and so on uh, uh, of, of nuclear explosions. So I did this many years ago, but I'm certainly not a specialist in this kind of thing, thank God. Now, I would like to make a few remarks uh, on, on, uh, on the topic tonight by quoting on the one uh, side uh, from an article of uh, Graham Famelo published in the Institute letter of the Institute of Advanced Studies last autumn. I got this uh, today by our member Gerhard Thür and I, uh, Thür and I highly appreciate that. It's about, uh, uh, it was an article about Churchill and the bomb. And it's quite interesting what, what he writes. He writes, and this is not, not irrelevant, in, in his book, 50 Years Hence, <coughs> Churchill had doubted whether politicians would be equal to the challenge of such powerful weapons. And this was, was uh, he first learned about the possibility of these weapons shortly because, before he became prime minister. And I quote now, great nations are no longer led by their ablest men 
or by those who know most about their immediate affairs, or even by those who have a coherent doctrine. Democratic governments drift along the line of least resistance, taking short views, paying their way with sobs and doles, and smoothing their path with pleasant-sounding platitudes. Why are you all smiling? <laughs> Do you see some connection to today's politics? Maybe even in our own country? Just a question I'm asking, I don't know. So this is actually very wise and very open. And uh, we know that this is still a problem today when we talk about nuclear we weapons and uh, new countries trying to, to, uh, to uh, achieve this uh, ability. I, I would also like to quote uh, from, the, from the review uh, written by, uh, by, uh, by Freeman Dyson. I just mentioned it. It was a beautiful review written by Freeman Dyson in the New York Review of Books of your, of your, of your book. And I will not say what he said about your book, which was certainly very nice. And, and so on, but, I, but he, recounts, he recounts two uh, 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 encounters with Oppenheimer, which both are very interesting. I actually count three, I only quote two of them. One was a, an, an encounter when uh, uh, there was a time, you know, when in Europe we had this, uh, 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 this, this uh, tactical weapons which were uh, put in place in the in the east and in the west, and Oppenheimer supported that. And apparently, uh, apparently, uh, Dyson asked Oppenheimer, "Why did you support this?" And he said, "Well, it's because because uh, uh, there was a battle going on in the U.S. between the army who wanted these battlefield weapons and the and the air force." who wanted big weapons to immediately destroy as many cities as possible. And for Oppenheimer, it was clear that he had to side with the army because in his view, that was the, the lower damage. I think that is quite an interesting story which tells us how crazy the time was back then. And, and it actually uh, 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 corroborates uh, Churchill's uh, uh, statement. And the other one is also very moving, where he says that shortly before uh, uh, Oppenheimer passed away, uh, he was approached by his, by his wife to talk to Oppenheimer about physics and so on. And Oppenheimer was apparently mainly interested in basic physics for all of his life and didn't think much of applications. And at that time, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, Dyson said, I started to talk with him, with him, but it was apparently too late. It was scientific life, life was over. But I say this because in, even as, uh, you know, building a bomb is certainly an application of, of science, whatever way you think about it, the heart of Oppenheimer was apparently in fundamental physics. And maybe you will tell us, you will test, tell us more about that. Now, before I give you the floor, uh, I would like to mention a personal experience, which is actually quite interesting, I think. Uh, I knew personally very well uh, John Archibald Wheeler, who was, uh, you know, is, he worked with Einstein at some time, and he was one of the leaders in, in gravitation theory, general relativity, and also foundations of quantum mechanics, and that's why, why I got in contact with him. And there was a, was a, 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 a celebration of his uh, uh, birthday in Princeton. I think it was the 80th, but I'm not sure. I, we can check the dates. And I was sitting on the table with him. I asked him, you know, when we talk, he, and he had been involved in the Manhattan Project. And I asked him, what are you today? What is your feeling about that? How, what is you, how do you see your own role? And he told me two things, and I just, I just convey them to you as a historic fact without any, without any comments. He said, firstly, he said, I have still many postcards at home of people, including 
parents of soldiers, of American soldiers, who thank me for my work because they think it might very likely have saved the lives of their, either their own lives or their family. And the other statement he made was that the biggest, and this is interesting, I didn't know that, the biggest uh, hospital which was ever built in the history uh, of mankind never went into operation. This was a statement by Vila. It was a, 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 a hospital built on some uh, Pacific island uh, for the casualties expected uh, in the invasion of Japan. Now, whatever, I just quote this. I don't want to, to judge it and so on. But having said that, I would like to give the floor to you, and I thank you very much for coming and presenting us something of your book. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to Professor Zeilinger for that very gracious uh, introduction. <clears throat> and I'd also like to thank him and the, the, the rest of the staff here at the Academy for making me so welcome and for allowing me the opportunity to give a lecture in this extraordinarily splendid hall, which is, I think, the finest hall I've ever lectured in. And while I'm thanking people, I would like to thank uh, Rad Miller and the directors of the Wittgenstein Initiative for making it possible for me to come over to Vienna and give this lecture. And finally, to you all for coming. Thank you very much. So, as Anton said, I'm going to talk about um, J. Robert Oppenheimer, whose biography I published last, last year. And I guess the first thing that arises from Anton's own introduction is why I should write a biography of a physicist and why I should write a biography of Oppenheimer in particular. After all, I'm not a physicist, I'm a philosopher, and my area of speciality is the philosophy of mathematics, uh, and particularly Wittgenstein's philosophy of mathematics. Now, just to indulge in a bit of autobiography just for a minute, it was actually my work in the philosophy of mathematics that got me into biography in the first place. And the way this works is this, that I was, I was, I was doing some postgraduate work on the, on the philosophy of mathematics, Wittgenstein's philosophy of mathematics, and it occurred to me that the dominant interpretations were mistaken, and mistaken in a particular kind of way, which is to say what they misunderstood was not just what Wittgenstein wrote about the philosophy of mathematics. What they misunderstood was Wittgenstein. And it seemed to me that if they understood Wittgenstein, if they understood what kind of person he was, what mattered to him, if they could read his work, so to speak, and pick up his tone of voice, because after all, this is what we do when we, when we know somebody very well. We, we, we know not only what they're saying, but what tone of voice they're speaking in. We can tell when they're being sarcastic, when they're being ironic, uh, when they're fed up, when they don't really mean what they say, and so on. All these things are involved in understanding somebody. And so I conceived the ambition of writing a biography that would try to, to unite two different bodies of literature that existed at that time. Wittgenstein at that time was very influential among academic philosophers and there was a huge secondary literature on Wittgenstein's philosophy. And then separately, there was a fairly sizable literature and, and body of artistic work actually that was inspired by Wittgenstein's personality. So Wittgenstein inspired filmmakers to, to, to make films about him. He inspired musicians to compose music. He inspired artists, as well as a whole load of uh, memoirs, beginning with Norman Malcolm's very fascinating memoir, and so on. So you had these two bodies, one of which was all to do with what an interesting and intense, spiritually preoccupied man Wittgenstein was, and the other to do with trying to shed light on what Wittgenstein said about logic and the philosophy of language and, and so on. My ambition was to unite these two, to show how it was that this man wrote this body of work, and also to try and show how an understanding of this man might help in an understanding of the work. In other words, I was trying to fuse together, so to speak, his spiritual 
preoccupations with his philosophical work. And my title, The Duty of Genius, I try, I try, to, try to do that because my, my guiding idea was that one could look at Wittgenstein's life from the point of view of the single duty to, to his genius, which had two aspects. One was to live decently, to be as decent a human being as he could be. The other was to think clearly. And my aim as a biographer was to show that thinking clearly and living decently were for Wittgenstein not separate things, but two sides of the same thing. Okay, now, fast forward several years to, to, to Oppenheimer. What is, what is the origin of my wanting to write a biography of Oppenheimer? Well, it had, had curiously, a, a, a similar kind of ambition in mind. About 12 years ago, I was asked by the Observer newspaper to uh, review a collection of Oppenheimer's correspondence. And until that time, I knew about Oppenheimer just what everybody knows about Oppenheimer, which is that he was a, a, an important scientist, that he directed the laboratory that produced the first atom bomb, and that after the war, he was a victim of the McCarthyite anti-communism. I didn't know that he was an expert on French literature. I didn't know that he wrote poetry. I didn't know that he wrote short stories. I didn't know that he had a deep fascination for philosophy, that he actually, in my own field, the philosophy of mathematics, he was very well read. Um, and then he was also deeply interested, and not in a dilettante kind of way, but in an expert kind of way, in the literature of Hinduism, to the extent where he learnt Sanskrit so that he could read the Hindu classics in the original language and he knew the Bhagavad Gita more or less off by heart. And also that he was politically involved in a way that I hadn't quite understood. In the 1930s, he once said that he, although he hadn't joined the Communist Party, he said that he'd joined every communist front on the west coast of America. Um, and then he was a very emotionally complex individual. So I said in this review, that there was a task to be done. There was, I said there was a great biography to be written here, which would be a terribly difficult book to write, but it would have as its aim to try and show that this man interested in Hinduism, who had this complicated emotional life, who had a deep ambivalence about himself throughout his life that expressed itself in all sorts of ways, that was an important scientist, that you know, was there in the middle of important historical events, that this was all somehow the same person. And I didn't know whether such a book could be written, but I said in the review, if it could, it would be, you know, a fascinating read. And then, of course, the inevitable happened when the, when the, when the review was published. Uh, uh, publishers got in touch with me and said, well, why don't you write this book? And I thought, yes, okay, I'll do it. Um, and it was indeed terribly difficult. Uh, it took me 11 years to write this book partly because I'm not a philosopher and it involved a lot of homework. And I was, uh, I was uh, helped in this homework by my friend James Dodd, who's a particle physicist. He's written a textbook on, on particle physics. And James served as my you know, one-to-one -one tutor in uh, uh, not just uh, science and Oppenheimer's papers, but also the history of science. And, and I read a great deal. Now... Just as I did with my Wittgenstein book on the, the duty of genius, I tried to bring together uh, disparate threads of Wittgenstein's life and work. This is what I tried to do with this title, Inside the Center. Um, I mean, maybe like most people who write books, I think obsessively about titles. I spend way too long thinking about titles. And um, Inside the Center was a phrase that I wanted to indicate several different things. The first thing is that I wanted it to indicate my ambition to write a biography of Oppenheimer that tried as much as possible to get inside the center of his own mind, that tried to get across what he was interested in, whether it was politics or science or uh, why he wanted to build a bomb, whatever it was. I wanted to, you know, try to get across what he himself thought and felt about those things. So that was the first sense of inside the center. The second sense of inside the center is that his scientific work 
was, uh, to a very large extent, concerned with what happens inside the center of an atomic nucleus. Uh, and of course, you know, he, I mean, Anton's perfectly right that Oppenheimer, and I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate this later on, but Oppenheimer was first and foremost a theoretical physicist, and actually he was pretty hopeless in the lab. He wasn't an experimental physicist at all. But nevertheless, it turned out that understanding the forces inside the center of an atomic nucleus had pretty powerful consequences. And Oppenheimer himself was, was a, a key figure in exploiting those consequences for better or for worse. And then finally, the phrase inside the center has a political dimension. Well, political and institutional with regard to science and politics. Oppenheimer, throughout his life, wanted to be inside the center. So if, you know, when, 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 he was, when he was concerned with science, he wanted to be at the center of development. And as we'll see, uh, by luck and by judgment, he managed to be right at the center at a number of crucial points in the history of physics. But then politically, he also wanted to be inside the center. And this dictated a number of things that he did throughout his life. He, you know, especially after the Second World War, he wanted to be where the big decisions were being made, which was Washington, D.C., and he wanted to be influencing those decisions. Okay, so he wanted to be inside the center, and as it were, so did I. I decided to begin the book with an account of his Jewish background, because it seemed to me that he was a very difficult person to understand, and one key, not the only key, and uh, you know, it's not a sufficient key, but one key to understanding some aspects of his ambivalent and difficult personality was to understand his own attitude towards his Jewish background. This is not a thought that originates with me. Oppenheimer's close friend, Isidore Rabi, uh, who came from a Jewish family uh, from New York, as did Oppenheimer. But there was a big difference. Rabi came from uh, uh, an Eastern European Jewish family uh, that settled in the Lower East Side of New York. Oppenheimer was from a very wealthy German Jewish family in the Upper West Side of New York. And although they're both New York Jews, um, that difference was such a big difference, they may as well have been brought up on different planets. But Rabi said about Oppenheimer that the thing about Oppenheimer was that he was made up of bright shining splinters and that these bright shining splinters never cohered into a single uh, coherent self. And Rabi thought that the reason they never did was to do with Oppenheimer's ambivalent attitude towards his own background. Rabi said about himself, when, although he was not religious, when he looked at Jews going to the synagogue, he could say, those are my people. And he said the fact that Oppenheimer couldn't say that, together with the fact that he interested himself in the religion of Hinduism rather than his own Judaism, meant that his self was splintered. Uh, and that was Rabi's account of why Oppenheimer's personality was so elusive and so difficult to get hold of. Okay, so I begin with an account of his family background. Now, the name Oppenheimer indicates immediately two things. One, if you're called Oppenheimer, you're Jewish, and two, that your ancestry lies in the German town of Oppenheim in the Rhineland. And you can see from these two pictures that Oppenheim has changed remarkably little uh, since the mid-19th century. Um, the Jews who lived in Oppenheim chose the name Oppenheimer when, uh, after the Napoleonic Decree of 1808, which uh, uh, presented a legal obligation on all Jews to adopt a surname which was not part, previously part of their culture. The same thing happened to, to, to all Jews, of course, and in particular to, to the Wittgenstein family. Um, the Wittgensteins did what a lot of Jewish uh, families in, in Germany and Austria did, which is they chose the name of their employer. Ludwig Wittgenstein's uh, ancestors worked for the princely Wittgenstein family, and when they had to uh, choose a surname, they adopted the name of their, uh, of their employer. Many Jews, like the Oppenheimers, chose the name of their locality. In the mid-19th century, there was a mass movement, particularly among German Jews, 
to look to America. And it's quite important, I think, from, from, to, to understand Oppenheimer, to understand the nature of this movement. It was not a question of fleeing for their lives. Their lives were not in danger. It was not like the, the, the Russian Jews who had to leave Russia at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, because their lives were in danger. It wasn't that kind of thing. It was a much more idealistic kind of thing. The German Jews prior, you know, in the early part of the 19th century had, had tried to integrate themselves into mainstream German culture and society by changing themselves to a large extent. They, they abandoned Hebrew as the language of worship, adopted German. They tried to dismantle as many of the barriers between themselves and the uh, non-Jewish German population as possible. And they found to their great frustration that this did not uh, improve their circumstances. They were still subject to special laws about where they could live, who they could marry, what kind of jobs they could do. And so they began to look to America, and their, their aspirations in that respect are expressed in this poem by, by uh, Goethe um, uh, to the United States. America, thou hast it better than our ancient hemisphere. Thou hast no falling castles nor basalt as here. Thy children, they know not their youthful prime to mar, vain retrospection nor ineffective war. Fortune wait on thy glorious spring, and when in time thy poets sing, may some good genius guard them all from barren robber, knight, and ghost traditional. What they were looking for, therefore, was freedom. Freedom from the past, freedom from the, all these ghosts and robbers and all these traditions that weighed down heavily upon them. And so they formed what's now called the second migration of, uh, of Jews to the United States. The first migration were the Sephardic Jews um, who had to leave Spain and Portugal. They were expelled from Spain and Portugal, and many of them ended up in, in, in the United States. And they formed the early Jewish community in the United States. Uh, and it was a fairly small community. By 1840, there were 15,000 Jews in the United States, the vast majority of whom were Sephardic Jews from Spain and Portugal. But that's when the mass migration of German Jews started. And 40 years later, in 1880, this second wave of Jewish immig uh, immigrants, which weren't Sephardic Jews but Ashkenazis, they were German Jews. And by 1880, the Jewish population in the States had grown to 280,000, the vast majority of whom were from Germany. Some of them were from, from Austria, but in, they were German-speaking uh, Jews. And they massively outnumbered the Sephardic Jews, who actually uh, were slightly resentful of, their, uh, of being supplanted uh, as leaders of the Jewish community uh, in the States. And then the same thing happened to the German Jews uh, in the third migration, which were the Polish and Russian Jews, uh, uh, including Isidore Rabia's family, uh, fleeing for their lives, 1880 to 1920. And this was on a different scale altogether. Uh, by, by 1920, there were roughly two and a half million uh, Eastern Jews in the United States of America, changing the character of the Jewish community utterly. At, at the time when Oppenheim, Oppenheimer was born in 1904, uh, in his childhood, there was still a kind of tussle going on, particularly in New York City, where he was brought up, between the uptown Jews in, in the Upper West Side, the German Jews, and the downtown Jews in the Lower East Side, uh, primarily Russian and, and Polish Jews. And there was a kind of conflict going on between those two uh, for, you know, uh, for, for leadership of the Jewish community, and eventually, by sheer weight of numbers, that battle would be won by the, by the Eastern Jews. The Eastern Jews, remember, were fleeing for their lives, and what they wanted from the United States was freedom to, to, to live as Jews. The German Jews wanted something else. The German Jews wanted freedom to live as Americans. They wanted to shake off um, as much as possible of their uh, German Jewish background. And this applied to Robert Oppenheimer's father, uh, Julius Oppenheimer, who came to the United States as a 17-year-old, uh, speaking very little English. Uh, he came in 1888 following his uncles, 
uh, Solomon and Sigmund, Sol and Sig, as they were known in the family, uh, who by, they, 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 they came uh, uh, some 20 years earlier, and by the time Julius arrived in 1880, Solomon and Sigmund had, had founded a very successful clothing company, Rothfeld Stern and Company, um, and Julius Oppenheimer slotted in immediately into this company and within a few years was a leading director of, of, of the company and an immensely wealthy man. So wealthy that he could afford to buy an apartment in this luxury block, 155 Riverside Drive, which is an enormously prestigious piece of real estate uh, on the Upper West Side of, of New York. Um, it's become famous to, to uh, sitcom aficionados uh, because 155 Riverside Drive is where Will and Grace live in the, in the sitcom Will and Grace. They live on the ninth floor. The Oppenheimers, remarkably, own the whole of the 11th floor. Um, you shudder to think what this would cost nowadays. This is the, the whole 11th floor of this massive apartment overlooking the Hudson River right there on Riverside Drive uh, on the west, uh, west side of uh, New, York, uh, New York City. Uh, the apartment was massive. It had, uh, when, Oppenheimer, uh, moved, when Oppenheimer was brought up there, there were several grand pianos in the, the apartment. The walls were hung with original artworks uh, by Van Gogh and uh, Picasso, uh, Renoir. Uh, when the family fell on hard times, when Robert Oppenheimer's uh, brother uh, was disbarred from teaching because of his connections with the Communist Party, he had to sell just one piece of art that he'd inherited from his parents to live in great style for the rest of his life. So this is where... Uh, Oppenheimer was brought up uh, in great style, in great comfort. They were immensely wealthy. The one thing Oppenheimer didn't have much of in his childhood was fun. Um, he, uh, his family were very wealthy and very serious and very high-minded. And what his father was mostly concerned with, apart from being a success in the, in, in the rag trade, was the ethical culture society. And the Ethical Culture Society formed the kind of intellectual milieu in which Oppenheimer was brought up. And this was, a, this was founded by uh, this man, Felix Adler. Felix Adler was the son of the rabbi of Temple Emmanuel, which was the uh, synagogue in the Upper West Side that all the German Jews, and this, this, by, the, by the late 19th century, this included some immensely wealthy people, uh, many of whom were bankers, Joseph Seligman, uh, Jakob Schiff, uh, Henry Morgenthau, uh, the Goldmans, the Saxes, um, all those names that you now associate with Wall Street and with prestigious uh, banking families. Those people lived on the Upper West Side and, uh, and before the Ethical Culture Society was established, they all went to the same synagogue, they all went to Temple Emmanuel. Felix Adler's father was the rabbi there, and Felix Adler was expected to become the next rabbi, except that when, when he was invited to give a talk at the synagogue, he gave a talk controversially about the, the, the death of religion, about the ruins of religion. His theme was, given that religious belief lies in ruins, what can we build upon those ruins? And his answer was, we can preserve from the great religions, and from Judaism in particular, ethics the morality, the duties that we have to each other, the duties that we have to ourselves, uh, the, the, the ideal of uh, citizenship, the ideal of helping one another, the, the ethical tradition in Judaism, according to Felix Adler, was what we can preserve when we give up all supernatural uh, beliefs. And he formed the Ethical Culture Society as what he called a religion of deed, not of creed. It was a kind of religion, but it wasn't a religion that was characterized by believing X, Y, and Z. It was a religion that was characterized by doing X, Y, and Z, where doing X, Y, and Z means helping unemployed people, helping destitute people, helping to uh, 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 build uh, America. And so it was, a, it, was a, it was a movement absolutely guaranteed to appeal to the descendants of uh, the, the German uh, Enlightenment tradition of the mid-19th century, and many of them, including Solomon and Sigmund Rothf uh, Rothfeld and Julius Oppenheimer, Robert Oppenheimer's father, they adopted this, this uh, 
so-called religion with enthusiasm and Julius Oppenheimer was a, a leading light in the ethical culture society and uh, brought his son Robert up within its, uh, 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 within its, 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 its uh, uh, beliefs. Including going to school. Oppenheimer, was when he went to school, he went to the ethical culture school. They set up their own school. Originally, it was for poor people uh, in, in, in New York City, but it was such a good school that privileged people were also happy to attend the school and happy to pay for the school. And within a generation, it had been transformed into a fee-paying school, uh, the clientele of which was almost exclusively drawn from wealthy German-Jewish families. Um, Oppenheimer went to the school fairly late. Um, uh, he, he didn't start attending school until he was uh, about seven years old. Um, and until then, he'd been educated privately and hadn't had much to do with other children and didn't really know how one dealt with other children. Um, somebody from the school remembers Oppenheimer in those years at school uh, trying to impress his schoolmates by saying, um, ask me a question in Latin and I'll reply in Greek, which was a very impressive thing for an eight-year-old to do, but not the way to win friends at, at a school. And uh, so he, he, he went through the school with having very few friends, actually. Uh, this is a very rare photograph of him actually being with a friend, although even then they don't look as if they're having that much fun. Uh, they're building things, which is one of the things he liked to do. Um, the other thing he liked to do was paint, and the other thing he liked to do was collect rocks. He, was, uh, he, he became a very keen uh, collector of rock samples uh, and joined the, the, the local geological society uh, and wrote letters to them, and they were so impressed by his knowledge, they invited him to give a talk. And when they were surprised when he arrived to find they'd invited a 12-year-old to address a learned society. So he went to the ethical culture school, and he didn't make many friends, but he did uh, acquire an excellent education. The ethical culture school became famous for... Uh, for getting kids into the best universities, including uh, Harvard University, which is where Oppenheimer wanted to go. The only friend he made, and this is very telling actually, the only friend he made at the Ethical Culture School was Francis Ferguson, who was one of the very few people who did not come from what uh, the, the German Jews called our crowd. Our crowd were the German Jews in the Upper West Side. Uh, Francis Ferguson didn't come from that community. He came from a community as bad as different from that a community as it's possible to get. He came from the western United States, from New Mexico. His family were prominent, but they were prominent in a very different way. Uh, they, were, they were pioneers, they were explorers, they were part of the, 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 the Wild West. Um, uh, his grandfather knew Billy the Kid and, and, and so on. And then his father became very respectable, became a lawyer, and was the first uh, representative of the state of New Mexico when New Mexico became a state. Now, before Har uh, Oppenheimer could go to Harvard, he fell ill and had to take a year out, much to his frustration. And for the first time in his life, he, he said about himself in his, child, in, in his childhood, uh, that he was uh, disgustedly, disgustingly well behaved. He, he, he said he had no uh, healthy outlets for being, for being a bastard. And um, the exception to that was when he was forced to stay at home before he could start at Harvard. He got very frustrated, he got very moody, he got very badly, badly behaved. And his parents looked to one of his teachers at the school, Herbert Smith, to take him away. And Herbert Smith decided to take up an invitation from Francis Ferguson's family to visit that family in New Mexico. And that was to have a profound influence on Oppenheimer um, and, as it turned out, a decisive influence on the development of the atomic bomb because Oppenheimer fell in love with New Mexico. He learned to ride. For the first time in his life, he was with a, a bunch of people that he felt at home with. Uh, Francis Ferguson was, was one of them. Paul Horgan was another. They, they, they had literary interests. They, they read extensively. Francis Ferguson's family were, uh, were famous novelists and famous journalists. And Oppenheimer absolutely loved the family. He loved the, uh, the scenery of New Mexico. And he loved exploring the upper Pecos Valley. And he came back to New York 
uh, people remember a completely transformed person where he'd previously been pale and sickly and shy and unsure of himself. He was now bold and confident and, uh, and so on. So he started Harvard in, 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 in 1922, a, a year later than Francis Ferguson. Both uh, Ferguson and uh, Oppenheimer chose to do chemistry because the ethical culture school had a very inspiring chemistry teacher and Oppenheimer fell in love with the science of chemistry. Um, but actually within a year of being at Harvard, he decided that really the really fundamental issues are not at the chemical level, they're at the physical level. And that if you really want to understand the forces of nature, you need to do physics rather than chemistry. And he came to that conclusion before he'd finished his uh, uh, freshman year uh, at Harvard. And he wrote to the physics department asking permission to attend. This is a remarkable, remarkably cocky thing to do. He, uh, he, was a, he was a first year freshman and he was asking the physics department if he could attend graduate level courses in physics including the then young uh, physics uh, of, of quantum physics, the, the, what, what's now called old quantum physics, the quantum physics of Einstein and Max Planck, which Oppenheimer precociously had, had, had been reading about. So the physics department said to Oppenheimer, well, you know, okay, you're a freshman chemist, chemist you, you don't know any physics, and you're asking to do graduate-level courses in physics. Um, prove to us that you can do it. And Oppenheimer then wrote out a list of books that uh, uh, he'd read. And this was to characterize Oppenheimer's... Well, I mean, we've already seen an example with the Greek and Latin thing. Um, he was very showy, Oppenheimer, throughout his life. And this list was about as showy a list as you could imagine. It included up-to-date works on the most abstruse and, and cutting-edge uh, theoretical physics that was around. Uh, some of the books were in German, some of them were in Dutch, some of them were in French. Um, and he sent this list to the physics department and uh, somebody said, well, uh, okay, he deserves to get a PhD just for knowing these titles. <laughs> so they gave him permission to attend these graduate level uh, courses. And he always said that, that there's a, a thing that physicists say, I mean, I'm not a physicist, so I'm, I'm certainly not allowed to be you know, dismissive in this respect. But many people who worked with Oppenheimer commented on the fact that there were curious holes in his knowledge and in his uh, upbringing. And in particular, he often made mistakes. Wolfgang Pauli, the great Austrian uh, physicist, uh, said about Oppenheimer, his physics is always interesting and his mathematics is always wrong. And he himself attributed this curious mixture of far-reaching advanced insight with the tendency to make mistakes to the fact that his education was very patchy and very odd. He hadn't gone through what most people who end up as physicists go through. He hadn't done first-year courses in, you know, he hadn't done physics 101, as it were. Uh, he'd, he'd jumped straight into the deep end. The first physics courses he did were graduate-level physics courses. And so he didn't have the sort of basic uh, background, but what he did have was an extraordinarily quick intellect. And so he could grasp, you know, physical ideas that were being discussed at a research level uh, as a second-year undergraduate. Uh, the, but the remarkable thing is, and this ties in with my, what got me interested in Oppenheimer in the first place, is the ex extraordinary breadth of his intellectual interests. While he was at Harvard, he didn't have time to do much other than attend courses. And he attended, first of all, he did an accelerated course in three years rather than four, which meant that he was doing more courses per year than most students. Secondly, he audited an extraordinary number of courses in an extraordinary number of different areas. So he did, he, he, he did courses in, in, in British history, in French literature, in all sorts of things. Uh, and, he, and, 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 and so he left Harvard with the best degree possible, but also with an extraordinary knowledge. He said that he raided the library, and he didn't really make many friends. This was partly also, it wasn't all, all his fault, it was partly because Harvard at that time was still in the grip of a rather vicious anti-Semitism. After all, in the summer of 1922, the summer before Oppenheimer went to Harvard, President Lowell of, of, of Harvard had 
seriously wanted to, to impose quotas on the number of Jews entering Harvard. And what prompted that was looking at what happened to Columbia University in New York City, where the number of Jewish students had grown to 40%. And for President Lowell, this was, this was a nightmare because it might drive out the, uh, the, the, the WASP, the, 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 uh, 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 the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who formed, you know, the, 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 who, who he really wanted at Harvard because what he really considered Harvard to be doing was not producing the next generation of research physicists but producing the next presidents and the next congressmen and, and, and so on. And so he wanted to impose a, a, a quota. He was voted down by the rest of the staff uh, but it shows, you know, the degree of anti-Semitism that still exists in an institutional kind of way in, in the United States. And Oppenheimer experienced that anti-Semitism at Harvard. Um, he couldn't join the best clubs. He couldn't uh, uh, have rooms in the best halls of residence. And it also shows in this tiny social life that he had, uh, really, apart from Francis Ferguson, who he already knew, the only two friends he had were William Boyd, who became a very successful uh, chemist in later life, and likewise Frederick Bernheim. And Frederick Bernheim had almost an identical upbringing to Oppenheimer. His home was on Riverside Drive. He went to the Ethical Culture School. He came to Harvard to study chemistry. He wanted to get out of, as Frederick Bernheim later said, he wanted to escape the Jewish ghetto, but was unable to do so. So it was a, it was a tiny world that Oppenheimer lived in, socially, but intellectually, he had, you know, the whole of Harvard's library at his fingertips, and he said he raided it like a, like a Viking raided a monastery. But he wanted to be at the center. Now, he'd, he'd, he'd read about uh, the development of physics, and as far as he was concerned, the center of physics at that time uh, was the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge, presided over by the great New Zealand uh, physicist, Ernest Rutherford, uh, who had been instrumental in introducing a new model uh, of, of the atom, uh, where previously uh, it had, uh, 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 Rutherford's predecessor, Thomson, was the first person to realize that electrons were part of an atom. But so embedded was this idea of an atom as a sort of indivisible sort of ball that Thomson pictured it as, as a sort of... He knew that electrons were negatively charged, but he, he pictured the, the negatively charged electrons as being placed uh, inside a great lump of positively charged stuff, and it was called the plum pudding model of the atom. So just like you have... Uh, uh, the, the, the plums placed in the pudding so you have the electrons placed in the, the, the pudding so to speak of the positively charged uh, uh, rest of the, the atom. Now Rutherford was the first person to realise that that was wrong and that the positively charged bit of the atom was a tiny little bit uh, to which he gave the name uh, nucleus um, and, in, and, and, in, and, and he pictured the electrons going around this, this positively charged uh, nucleus. And that completely transformed, you know, our understanding of the basic stuff of matter. Uh, it was about as fundamental an advance in, in, in science as it's possible to get. And Oppenheimer wanted, therefore, to work with Rutherford. So he wrote to Rutherford asking to work for him, got uh, referees from scientists at Harvard who said, Oppenheimer's a, a brilliant young man, uh, but he's hopeless in the laboratory. And Rutherford therefore rejected him. And it was the first experience of rejection uh, in uh, intellectual life that Oppenheimer had ever faced. Uh, and it was a bit of a shock to him. But meanwhile, he was accepted by the college at, uh, at, at Cambridge, uh, Christ College, Cambridge. They accepted him. So he's in the humiliating position of graduating from Harvard, going to Cambridge officially as an undergraduate student. Um, not working with Rutherford, but working actually with Rutherford's predecessor, J.J. Thomson, the discoverer of the electron, who by that time was an old man more interested in gardening than in physics. Um, and Oppenheimer had a miserable time at Cambridge. It was the most miserable year of his life by a long way. And it's probably not an exaggeration to say that during this year he had a nervous breakdown. Uh, he was actually diagnosed with schizophrenia during this year, but that must surely be... Uh, a misdiagnosis. What is for certain, though, is that he behaved in a very strange way during his year at Cambridge. Um, 
he was sometimes asked to give uh, uh, reports to the other members of the Cavendish Laboratory on his work. He'd been assigned uh, uh, experimental work to do, uh, and he was very bad at doing it, and he didn't really n understand what he was doing or how he should be doing it. And they remember him giving these reports by standing in front of a blackboard with a piece of chalk in his hand, saying over and over again, the point is, the point is, the point is, until somebody led him away. And he was also remembered by people writhing around on the floor uh, of the Cavendish Laboratory. But the strangest thing was yet to come. The strangest thing is that he tried to kill PMS Blackett. There's PMS Blackett on the left. Blackett was a legendary figure in Cambridge in those days, uh, a brilliant experimental physicist, later to win the Nobel Prize, known as Rutherford's favorite, but also an impossibly glamorous figure. He was always better dressed than anybody else, taller than anybody else, better looking than anybody else. Um, and he was given the job of leading Oppenheimer through the tricks of the trade, so to speak, of an experimental physicist. And Oppenheimer grew to resent him so much that he tried to kill him. And the way he tried to kill him was charged with symbolic significance. He, he got hold of an apple and poisoned the apple and left it on Blackett's desk. Like a wicked witch. Now, it didn't work. And Cambridge, remarkably, didn't expel Oppenheimer. They didn't think attempted murder was grounds for excluding him from the university. What, what they did was insist that he see a psychiatrist. And it was that psychiatrist that diagnosed him as schizophrenic. It didn't do any good. But within six months, so the first six months of Oppenheimer's time at Cambridge, it's no exaggeration to say that he was crazy. He was behaving in an absolutely crazy way. Not only did he try and kill Blackett, he also, when he went to, for a holiday in France at the end of his first term at Cambridge, tried to kill Francis Ferguson. Francis Ferguson visited him in a hotel in Paris and was just bending over. He'd been telling Oppenheimer that he'd had success with girls finally and he, he had a, a girlfriend. He'd just turned around to get something from his trunk when Oppenheimer came up behind him with a leather strap, turned the leather strap around Francis Ferguson's neck and tried to strangle him to death. Now, Francis Ferguson is a bigger, stronger man than Oppenheimer and sh shook him off. Uh, and again, remarkably, a bit like Cambridge, Ferguson did not regard this as grounds for discontinuing his friendship with, with Oppenheimer. Um, he carried on being Oppenheimer's friend, but you know, made sure not to be in a locked room with him. So Oppenheimer behaved in a bizarre way. And yet, within a few months of that, so that strange incident with Francis Ferguson happened in the Christmas vacation of 1925. By the spring of 1926, Oppenheimer was not only sane, but was publishing his first papers in academic, uh, in academic journals. Why the transformation? It certainly wasn't that he was helped by seeing these, uh, uh, this psychiatrist in, in London. Rather, it was because he became involved in theoretical physics at a tremendously exciting time in the history of theoretical physics. And, and one of the reasons that this book took me so long to write was that he was involved in so many historically important epochs and developments. And one of them was the development of quantum mechanics, the new quantum physics in, in 1926, um, called Boy's uh, Physics by, by Wolfgang Pauli, because the, the people who made uh, the fundamental contributions to that uh, uh, to that development, including uh, the German physicist Werner Heisenberg, were very young. They were in their 20s. One of them was at Cambridge, Paul Dirac, uh, absolutely brilliant uh, uh, physicist, uh, then still in his 20s, uh, uh, working at uh, Trinity College, Cambridge, um, universally regarded by physicists as the most important British physicist uh, since Newton, um, and actually uh, a very strange man in all sorts of ways. Um, I think he, he, he would now be diagnosed with, what, uh, with what's called autism. He, uh, the, 
physicists of a certain generation, when you, when you interview them and get to know them, they will, pull, they will tell Paul Dirac stories. And I'll, I'll just tell one of these stories to indicate what I mean when I say that he, was, he would be diagnosed with autism. Paul Dirac once was invited to a university to give a lecture. He gave the lecture, and the person chairing the, the uh, lecture said, well, are you happy to take questions? And Dirac said, yeah. So somebody stuck their hand up and said, uh, Professor Dirac, I don't understand that uh, equation that you've written on the top uh, right-hand corner of, of, of the board. So Dirac nodded, didn't say anything. And the silence became uncomfortable. And the chair said to Dirac, well, perhaps you'd like to answer the question. And Dirac said, without any hint that he was being uh, smart aleck or funny, Dirac said, it wasn't a question. <laughs> That's the kind of man Dirac was. Um, Oppenheimer said he thought Dirac was magnificent. He really admired Dirac. Now, Dirac was, was right at the heart of the developments in the, in, 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 in the newly uh, discovered field of quantum mechanics. Uh, Dirac was, w w went to the continent. Uh, he, he, he discussed these ideas with all the leading figures, Niels Bohr, Max Born, Werner Heisenberg, and gave the first series of lectures, at came, uh, the first series of lectures in England on quantum mechanics at Cambridge. And Oppenheimer attended those lectures and became very excited by them and became absolutely gripped by the ideas of quantum mechanics, this new, exciting, fundamentally important branch of physics. Oppenheimer became gripped by it, forgot all about what he was trying to do in the laboratory, and became gripped by ideas uh, uh, of, of, of position and momentum and all the uh, trying to understand the weird du duality of, of particles that quantum mechanics had discovered, where you were supposed now to imagine particles uh, uh, as both waves and as particles, you, you were, uh, uh, Einstein had suggested that we imagine uh, light as being made up of little packets of energy, little uh, photons, uh, and, but, but, but the, the wave nature of light was a demonstrable fact. And what was now being asked in quantum mechanics was to picture these things as both waves and as particles. Um, Somebody suggested, well, maybe we could think of them as waves on Tuesdays and Thursdays and as particles on Mondays and uh, Wednesdays and Fridays. But anyway, it, it introduced fundamentally new and important ideas, and Oppenheimer was right there at the thick of it, inside the center. And this had a transformative effect on him, magnified by the appearance at Cambridge of two of the leading figures in this. Uh, so not only did he have Paul Dirac, he also had Niels Bohr, who he came to admire more than anybody else in the world. Uh, throughout the rest of his life, if you asked Oppenheimer who his hero was, he would say Niels Bohr because of Niels Bohr's you know, uh, single-minded determination to get to the truth of physical processes. Niels Bohr visited Cambridge, and uh, Oppenheimer had an opportunity to, dis to discuss quantum mechanics with him, as did the person sit seated on the right there, Max Born, who was a professor of physics at Göttingen University, who was so impressed when he met uh, uh, Oppenheimer in the spring of 1926. And, and remember, this is just a few months after he was manifesting, you know, uh, straightforwardly crazy behavior. Uh, Max Born was so impressed with Oppenheimer that uh, he, he did two things. One is he asked Oppenheimer tra to translate into English a paper he'd just written in German. And secondly, he invited him to complete his PhD studies at the University of, of Göttingen. And so Oppenheimer left experimental physics, left Cambridge, and went to Göttingen. And from there on, his scientific life flourished. Um, and within uh, a few months of being at Göttingen, he'd written uh, his PhD thesis, which uh, was accepted, uh, and he'd written a number of important papers, including a joint paper with, uh, with, 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 with Max Born, uh, all about quantum chemistry. And if you look at a textbook on quantum chemistry uh, now, you will see sometimes a whole chapter, but in any case, uh, a mention of what's called the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which is an approx uh, a way of calculating the energies in a molecule. Uh, and uh, uh, Oppenheimer, while still a young man, uh, was contributing now, making, you know, important contributions to 
uh, uh, fundamental science. And therefore attracted the attention of administrators from American universities. American universities were conscious at that time that all the really important cutting-edge theoretical work was being done on the European continent. And they wanted a slice of that action. They wanted people who'd sat at the feet of Born and Bohr and Heisenberg to come to the States and, you know, lead their physics departments. And so somebody like Oppenheimer, who by, you know, uh, uh, by 1927 had acquired a reputation as being one of the leading young physicists of his generation, um, he was in great demand and he could dictate his terms. And so the terms that he dictated were that he was to come back to, the, to, 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 to America, he would spend some time at Harvard, then he would spend uh, some time at Caltech, at, at the California uh, Institute of, of, of Technology, and then return to Europe, because he, he still felt that he had more to learn from the European physicists. Um, he went first to the University of Leiden uh, to work with the physicist Paul Ehrenfest, uh, but quickly decided that he, uh, that he wanted to be elsewhere. And again, with his uncanny knack of being at the center, he went to Zurich, uh, where he worked with Wolfgang Pauli, at the very birth of one of the most successful branches of science that's ever been developed, which is QED, quantum electrodynamics, which uh, uh, Pauli was laying the foundations for at this time with Werner Heisenberg, and Oppenheimer joined in their discussions, and there was actually you know, uh, um, uh, a three-man paper written by Oppenheimer, Heisenberg, and Pauli, uh, which is now recognized as, as one of the foundations of QED. And Oppenheimer had a great time in Zurich. It was at Zurich that he met uh, uh, Isidore Rabi, who I mentioned earlier, who became one of his closest friends. And he, you know, he, was, he was able to soak up some of these exciting uh, developments. And here's one of my favorite photographs of Oppenheimer, uh, taken on a boat in Lake Zurich. Uh, Oppenheimer with his uh, uh, trademark pork pie hat, smoking a cigarette. He smoked far too much throughout his life. It eventually killed him. Uh, Isidore Rabi there, nominally in charge of the boat, but I'm not sure I'd want Isidore Rabi in charge of my boat. And then Wolfgang Pauli glaring malevolently at the camera. Wolf Wolfgang Pauli was a, a very mischievous figure, and you can see there, well, he looks not just mischievous, he looks positively demonic. But anyway, um, after Zurich, again Oppenheimer was in a position to dictate his terms, and his terms this time were that he would spend, he would have a joint appoint appointment in California. He would spend half the year in Northern California at UC Berkeley, and then he would spend the rest of the year, the, the, the second half of the year, in Southern California, in Pasadena, uh, at Caltech. The reason he wanted that unusual arrangement was that Caltech was an established center of excellence in, in physics, and he could learn from the best people that, that existed in the United States at Caltech. But UC Berkeley was, so to speak, virgin territory, and Oppenheimer chose UC Berkeley for that purpose because he, he realized that what he could do at Berkeley, he could build his own department. He could build a department in his own image. And that's what he proceeded to do throughout the 1930s. And he, had, he, he was so successful, but by, by the end of the 1930s, Berkeley was recognized as the best department in physics uh, in the United States of America. And the United States of America was recognized as having taken over from Germany as the world center of theoretical physics. And right at the heart of that development, both at, you know, in establishing Berkeley uh, within America and establishing America uh, across the world, right at the center of that was Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer never taught undergraduates. He didn't bother with that. He only taught graduates. Uh, but he built up a tremendously loyal and able group of graduates who, uh, who hero-worshipped him. They, they imitate his style. Um, uh, one of the things that they, they, they worshipped about him was his wide range of interests. That, you know, they, they, they learned classical music. They learned about classical music from him. They learned about literature from him. They learned about Hinduism. But above all, they learned uh, quantum mechanics. And he had a whole, uh, a whole bunch. He attracted more and more graduate students to Berkeley and he established this, this school, which turned out to be developed into the most important school of theoretical physics uh, in the country. He was helped in that by his friendship with Ernest Lawrence, who was an experimentalist. Ernest Lawrence won the Nobel Prize uh, for his development of, 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 
of the cyclotron, uh, an early particle accelerator, Lawrence was one of the first people to realize the principles of accelerating charged particles. Um, and there's a story that, that the afternoon that it occurred to him, how you could keep you know, accelerating a particle by using its charge. Uh, on, the, on the afternoon that occurred to him, he was sauntering down the road and somebody said, you look cheerful. He said, yes, I've, I've just won the Nobel Prize. Uh, he knew how important this would be. Oppenheimer and Lawrence became very close friends, but, but one effect of that was a fruitful collaboration between an experimentalist and, and, and a theoretician, such that uh, Lawrence could present to Oppenheimer and his group of brilliant graduate students puzzling things that uh, uh, he'd observed uh, using his, his cyclotrons. And then, in return, Oppenheimer and his students could present to, 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 to Lawrence some things that they wanted to test and see whether, you know, the theory predicted X, Y, and Z. Did X, Y, and Z really occur? Well, Lawrence had the big machinery, the beginnings of big science, uh, to test those hypotheses. Um, and, and so theory and, and, and practice, uh, theoretical physics and experimental physics, went hand in hand in UC Berkeley, and, and that was an important element in establishing uh, the centrality of that department. Meanwhile, Oppenheimer kept up his interest in New Mexico. He bought this uh, uh, rather uh, uh, undistinguished-looking house in, 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 in New Mexico, but it had a fantastic view. Um, and the story goes that when, when he was introduced to the house, uh, he said, hot dog. And uh, the Spanish for hot dog is perro caliente, and so that's what he called his house. And it became a center for his students. He invited all his favorite students to New Mexico, uh, where people report there wasn't a great deal to eat, but there was a great deal to drink. And there was also a lot of uh, exciting and stimulating discussion of theoretical physics. Now, throughout those years, Oppenheimer had taken very little interest in politics, so much so that he didn't know about the Wall Street crash until about a year later. Lawrence said, you know, he mentioned the crash, and, and Oppenheimer said, what? Yeah. Um, but he got, to, he got interested in politics, as, and, and particularly the result of the crash, the depression that, that hit the 1930s. He became interested in that through the experience of his grad students, because what he found was those who weren't uh, placed in, you know, jobs in, 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 in physics in universities throughout the States had to do low-paid work and that gave Oppenheimer some insight into what it was like to be a low-paid worker uh, in depression-hit America. And it wasn't very nice. And, and Oppenheimer became uh, very concerned about that and did, you know, tried, tried to do what he could to help them and ended up joining a whole bunch of organizations designed to alleviate the suffering of unemployed and badly paid people in the United States. And as it turned out, most of those groups were communist front organizations. Many of his, almost all his students and many of his closest friends had actually joined the Communist Party. His first fiance, uh, he never married her, they, they split up before they married, but they, they were engaged. Uh, Jean Tatlock there on the left, uh, he, was, he was very deeply in love with Jean Tatlock. She was a member of the Communist Party. On the right, you've got Hakam Chevalier, who taught uh, French at, uh, at UC Berkeley and was also a member of the Communist Party uh, and, and encouraged Oppenheimer along that road. And then in the middle, you've got this very fateful photograph um, of four of Oppenheimer's uh, grad students, Joe Weinberg, Rossi Lomenitz, David Bohm, and Max Friedman, all of them students of Oppenheimer and all of them members of the Communist Party. Now, I say this photograph is fateful because it was to have a sorry influence on the lives of all four people pictured here and on Oppenheimer himself. The way this works is this. The FBI knew that Rosie, uh, Rossi Lomenitz uh, was a member of the party and they had recordings of him meeting people they knew to be involved in Soviet espionage. And so they followed Rossi Lomenitz everywhere. Rossi Lomenitz on this day met his friends and they had a, a photograph taken by a street photographer, uh, took a copy of the photograph, went on their way. The FBI guy tailing Lomenitz went up to the street photographer and said, I'll have that camera, thank you very much. 
And this photograph then ended up in the FBI file of Lomonitz, and then they tracked down the other people in the photograph and had them followed and surveyed. Uh, and mysteriously, they began to find that whenever they were offered any kind of job, uh, within a few days, the offer would be withdrawn. It was around that time they, they, they traced all these people to o uh, Oppenheimer, and J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, became convinced that Oppenheimer was not only a communist, but in, op in J. Edgar Hoover's words, one of the most subversive and dangerous men in the United States. And so J. Edgar Hoover began, opened a file on Oppenheimer, which grew to enormous lengths. I went through, one of, the, you know, one of the things I did in my 11 years of research was go to Washington, D.C. and look through the FBI file on Oppenheimer. It is absolutely immense. They followed Oppenheimer everywhere. They bugged his phone at home. They bugged his phone at work. And they tailed anybody that he had anything to do with. Um, and the transcripts of, of all his phone conversations are there in the file. It's a tremendously valuable biographical resource. Uh, but of no help to the security of the United States. There's one uh, conversation that there's a transcript of where Oppenheimer is, uh, uh, he's away on business and he's phoning his wife and uh, his wife says, what's that noise on the line? And Oppenheimer says, oh, that'll be the FBI hanging up. <laughs> he knew that he was on very close surveillance. Okay, so now... The 1930s. In 39, the very beginning of 39, physicists made a momentous discovery, which was nuclear fission. And I haven't got to, the, the fascinating story about how this uh, uh, spread from Germany uh, to the Allies uh, and, then, and then traveled across the Atlantic in the person of Niels Bohr. And then Niels Bohr told all, told all the great uh, American physicists and it spread like wildfire across America. And everybody realized that fission would produce energy which potentially was the make, could, could be made into a bomb. You know, by, by within a few months of 1939, every physicist, experimental physicist and uh, uh, theoretical physicist, in both the west uh, uh, of Europe and the east of Europe, they all realized that a fission bomb was a practical possibility. The United States was very slow in getting a research program up and running into how you might build a bomb and that program didn't really get anywhere until they appointed this man, General Groves, in, in charge of it. And General Groves, it was, who insisted on Oppenheimer leading the scientific part of that enterprise. Now, think of all the reasons why Oppenheimer should not have been given that job. First of all, he wasn't an experimental physicist. Secondly, he'd never been in charge of anything. He'd never been chair of the uh, physics department. Uh, he, he had a great influence on the physics department, but he never had any administrative experience. As somebody once said about Oppenheimer, he'd never so much run a hot dog stall. He, he hadn't run anything. And then thirdly, he was regarded by J. Edgar Hoover as one of the most dangerous people in the United States. And this was the man that General Groves wanted to head the biggest and most important military operation in the United States of America. Why? Why did General Groves want Oppenheimer? The reason for that is that Groves, when he took charge of this operation, made it his business to visit all the scientists who had some knowledge of fission. So he went to Chicago to, to, to have conversations with Arthur Compton. He went to New York City, talked to Isidore Rabi, uh, among other people, Leo Zillard. Uh, he, he went to California to talk to Ernest Lawrence. And he got very frustrated by two things. One is, he couldn't understand a word these people said. And secondly, he didn't sense from them any great urgency about getting the job done, about actually making a bomb. They were very interested in the physics of fission, but not terribly interested in how that, you know, practically how that might uh, furnish, you know, uh, the know-how to make a bomb. While he was in California, Ernest Lawrence introduced Groves to Oppenheimer, and Oppenheimer had already been thinking about the bomb and poured out his thoughts to General Groves, 
and showed what many people realized when they saw Oppenheimer on the television in the 1950s, that he had a gift for explaining difficult ideas very clearly. And Groves was immediately struck by that, that Oppenheimer could explain to him what was going on in the science. But also, Oppenheimer, driven by his politics, actually, driven by his acute awareness of what was happening in Nazi Germany and the horror of Werner Heisenberg, one of the, you know, Oppenheimer knew that Oppenheimer, uh, Heisenberg was still in Nazi Germany, was potentially still working for the, for the Nazis, and he, you know, Oppenheimer reasoned, well, you know, if anybody is going to work out how to make a bomb from fission, Heisenberg is going to be that man. So Oppenheimer was saying to Gross, we've got to get this job done as quickly as possible. And Oppenheimer said, look, you know what I think you should do? I think you should get all the scientists involved, those in Chicago, those in New York, those in Virginia, those in Washington, in California, wherever they might be, get them all together in one single place. And he says, I know the place, New Mexico. <laughs> so this is why, of all places, Los Alamos was chosen uh, as the place to host. Uh, I mean, just like Oppenheimer was an unlikely choice for director, Los Alamos is an extraordinarily unlikely place to build a scientific laboratory. Um, you know, on the face of it, it was mad, but it had a big advantage, which is it could get all these people together. Groves wanted to impose uh, the, the procedure of secrecy known as compartmentalism, which means nobody knows any more than they absolutely need to know. And Oppenheimer persuaded him, you can't do science like that. You've got to have free discussion. And so getting them all together in the middle of nowhere in the, Los in the New Mexican hills was a way of realizing both Oppenheimer's desires and Groves's. They could get them all, all these scientists together in one place and you could keep an eye on them. And so people in Los Alamos at that time, which before that time was a very tiny town, uh, notable for nothing except having a, a ranch school there, uh, they suddenly noticed, pe people described two sets of people, said suddenly the town was overrun, first of all by these scruffy young men with rolled up sleeves and, 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 and sneakers and jeans. And secondly, these rather sinister-looking guys with three-piece suits and shades who always went around in twos. <laughs> and, uh, and so these two groups of people, the spooks and the scientists, invaded uh, Los Alamos and turned it in to uh, uh, the, you know, the laboratory that was to produce the, the, the bomb. Um, in the meantime, Groves... Paul moved heaven and earth. It was first realized by Niels Bohr and, and John, John Wheeler, actually. Anton mentioned John Wheeler. John Wheeler and, and Niels Bohr were the first people to realize that you can't make a bomb from natural uranium, uranium-238. You need a very rare isotope of uranium, 235, and 235 occurs in less than 1% of natural uranium. But if you're going to make a bomb, you've got to separate the more fissile 235 from the natural 238. And Bohr, when he realized that, said, so we're never going to make a bomb. He said, because to make a bomb, you'd have to separate those isotopes. And that involves turning the whole of the United States into one big factory. Well, that's what Groves was prepared to do, in effect. He acquired massive amounts of land in Tennessee and in the state of Washington, and he built cities. He built Hanford in Washington, Oak Ridge in Tennessee. At that time, nobody really knew the best way to separate isotopes. Maybe you could do it by gaseous diffusion. Maybe you could do it electronic, uh, uh, electromagnetically. Maybe you could do it by centrifugal methods. All these different methods were, were, were devised, were invented uh, for separating isotopes. And Gross said, we'll do them all. We'll build factories for all of them. The most remarkable fact, I think, about the Manhattan Project, the Manhattan Project employed over 100,000 people, most of whom were not scientists. Most of the employees of the Manhattan Project were actually women, and they were women working in conditions as pictured in this uh, photograph here. This is a picture of Oak Ridge, Tennessee. There were nearly 100,000 women employed at Oak Ridge and Hanford doing jobs like this, and they had absolutely no idea what they were doing. What they were, in fact, doing was producing the, uh, the, the enriched uranium that was used for the bomb. 
But what they were told to do was sit at these, these, these uh, banks of you know, indicators and dials and things, and they were told, look, if this dial goes this way, turn this switch this way. If this dial goes this way, turn this switch. And so they were looking at dials and turning switches with no idea that what they were doing was controlling maybe a gaseous diffusion isotope separation plant. And they didn't realize that what they'd done was produce the material that was used in the Hiroshima bomb until after the bomb uh, had gone off. But remarkably, Oppenheimer, heading the Los Alamos uh, laboratory, by the summer of 1945, having s s started less than two years before that, had successfully invented and designed not just one bomb, but two bombs, a bomb using uranium and a bomb using plutonium, which doesn't even exist in nature. The only way of making plutonium is as a byproduct of, of, of nuclear reactions. And nobody knew anything about plutonium before they started work. And they had to develop a new science, a new metallurgy of, of plutonium. Uh, and as it turned out, it's incredibly difficult to build a bomb with plutonium because you can't... With uranium, it's simple. You just get two subcritical uh, uh, bits of uranium, fire them together, and it goes bang. But with plutonium, you can't do that because it's giving off too many, uh, too many uh, neutrons. And you have, to, you have to use what's called implosion. You have to squeeze it together to get the critical mass from an increased density rather than just increased amount of uh, material. And they realized all that in Los Alamos. It's, it's sometimes said that no serious science was done at Los Alamos. Actually, some pretty interesting stuff was done by the scientists at Los Alamos. After all, they had some of the greatest scientists in the world, not just the American homegrown scientists, the graduates of Oppenheimer, but also the refugees uh, from, from Germany and from Austria and from Italy. The very best people in the world were gathered together at Los Alamos finding out new things about plutonium and about uranium, about shaped charges and about all sorts of things. Uh, Winston Churchill once said, the reason we, the Allies, won the war is that our Germans were better than their Germans. And some of those Germans were involved in Los Alamos. Okay, so by the summer of 1945, they were ready to test the bomb and they tested the plutonium bomb. They were so sure the uranium bomb would, would work, they didn't even bother testing it. They tested the plutonium bomb and Oppen it's, it's given rise to one of the most famous quotations of Oppenheimer's. He said when he saw the bomb, when they were gathered to watch this extraordinary, awe-inspiring sight of the mushroom cloud going up, Oppenheimer said, a few people laughed, a few people cried, most people were silent. He said, I remembered the line from the Bhagavad Gita, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. So there's the fat man bomb, which is the plutonium bomb, uh, which tremendously complicated bomb. You've got to get the implosion just right, otherwise you end up with something. You know, it's, otherwise, it's, it's as if you've you know, trodden on a Coke can or something. You, you just get a, a, a misshapen lump of stuff. So you, you've got to get the implosion absolutely right, and that was the difficult bit. And then the little boy bomb. The little boy bomb was the one used on, in Hiroshima. The fat man bomb was the one used uh, at Nagasaki. And by the way, most of the scientists supported the use of the bomb over Hiroshima for the reasons that Anton suggested, uh, that they, it would save tens of thousands, possibly even hundreds of thousands of lives of American servicemen uh, because they knew, uh, they knew how expensive it, in terms of life it would be to take these islands one by one from the Japanese. You had very dug-in defenses the, uh, the uh, military advantage would be with the defense rather than with attack. To take these islands by mounting assaults on them one by one would have cost uh, an enormous number of lives. So most scientists supported the use of the Hiroshima bomb. None of them understood or supported the use of the Nagasaki bomb. And Oppenheimer uh, was one of those. Oppenheimer was appalled when the second bomb went off. He just could not understand why the United States used that second bomb so quickly after the first bomb. Um, and Groves, uh, uh, Joseph Rotblatt was the only person to leave Los Alamos on conscientious grounds. And one of the things that persuaded him to leave was hearing Groves say, well, you realize this is no longer about defeating the Germans. It's not even about defeating the, the Japanese. It's about impressing the Soviet Union. Uh, and that seems to be 
why the second bomb was used. It wasn't to, to, to make the Japanese surrender. The Japanese were already offering terms of surrender. It was to give the Soviet Union the impression that, the, that America had an unlimited number of these bombs. Actually, that was a completely false impression. After Nagasaki, they didn't have any more bombs. They had to uh, you know, assemble some more, and, and that would take some, some time. But they'd done their job. They'd given the impression that they could keep dropping these bombs. And after the war, Oppenheimer became the most celebrated scientist in the United States. He was so famous that when the semi-popular journal Physics Today started, they decided to have as their first cover a picture of Oppenheimer, but they realized he was so famous they didn't even need to have Oppenheimer. Um, they could just have his hat resting on a cyclotron, and everyone knew that was Oppenheimer. He'd replaced Einstein, in effect, as the most famous physicist living in the United States of America. And he wanted to use his fame for political ends. From the end of the Second World War to the time he died, Oppenheimer essentially did no more science. He, he was involved in uh, involved a sort of midwife. He helped other people uh, develop their scientific ideas. But he himself did, published no research papers, did no original research uh, from, from 1945 until his, his death in 67. Because what he wanted to do was have an influence at the center of political life. And he was so concerned with that that he left his jobs at Berkeley and Caltech, moved from California to the east coast of America, took up a job as director of the Institute for Advanced Study at, uh, at Princeton, mainly so that he could be within reach of Washington, D.C., because what he considered to be now his job was influencing the politicians at Washington, D.C., uh, and influencing them in a way that would realize a dream that he actually had discussed with Niels Bohr, a dream of establishing international cooperation for the use, for, for the ownership of, international ownership of uranium uh, and international control of uh, uh, atomic and nuclear energy. Niels Bohr had said, look, to Oppenheimer, look, this bomb that you developed could be the worst thing that mankind has ever experienced, or it could be the best. And the reason it could be the best is that its effects are so horrific that it might finally get people to seek ways other than war to resolve conflicts between nations. And that was Oppenheimer's great dream as the Second World War came to an end and he wanted to influence politicians at Washington. He wanted to realize Niels Bohr's dream of using the the ferocity, the awe-inspiring power of atomic weapons to establish international cooperation. He was frustrated in that, of course, uh, partly by the intransigent attitude of the Soviet Union and partly, who, who after all, uh, they knew all about the atomic bomb because they had people uh, like Klaus Fuchs, uh, like the Rosenbergs, giving them information. Uh, at the Potsdam meeting, uh, when uh, uh, Truman told, told, told uh, Stalin about the, the, the bomb, he was amazed that Stalin seemed so little surprised. Well, Stalin knew all about the bomb. Uh, and the Soviet Union had their own uh, uh, program up and running. And by 1949, they had their own atomic bomb. And by then, it was realized the extent of Soviet espionage in American life, not just in scientific life, but in military life, in all aspects of life. And so began the reaction called McCarthyism, where after realizing the incredible extent of Soviet penetration of all levels of American society, the reaction then set in was to suspect anybody who was in the slightest bit uh, uh, left wing. And Oppenheimer uh, came in for that suspicion. And he didn't, he, he, he amplified that suspicion by his attitude to the hydrogen bomb. Now, Edward Teller, who was at Los Alamos, was never very interested in fission. Teller realized that you could make more powerful bombs not by fissioning he heavy elements like uranium uh, and plutonium, but by fusing light elements like hydrogen and isotopes of uh, uh, hydrogen, uh, tritium, deuterium, and so on. Teller realized that if you could fuse those elements, then you could, you, you, you could keep adding to the power of the bomb. There would be no theoretical limit to how powerful a fusion bomb could be. And to begin with, Teller, so Teller was at Las Alamas, and, and Oppenheimer 
gave Teller his own room and his own staff so that he could work on nuclear fusion, partly to get him out of the way because Teller was a, a notoriously difficult person to work with, and partly because that's what Teller wanted to do. He wanted to work on fusion. Now, to begin with, they couldn't solve the problem of actually how to use the energy from fusion in such a way as to get more energy out than you put back in. You, you, in order to get light elements to fuse together, you've got to get them moving at incredible velocities. You've got to use an extraordinary amount of energy. And it was realized that the way to do that was to have a primary fission reaction which would create the necessary energy to get the, uh, to, to, to get the nuclei to fuse together, thus releasing uh, fusion energy. And Oppenheimer himself described the corresponding uh, design. Uh, it was worked on by, by Stanislav Ulam and Edward Teller. It's called the Ulam-Teller design. Oppenheimer himself described it as technically sweet. Nevertheless, Oppenheimer campaigned against, both inside the government and outside the government, campaigned against the hydrogen bomb just on the grounds that it was militarily useless. It was such a powerful bomb. You, you can make, I, I mean, the most powerful uh, hydrogen bomb that's been tested in history is 52 megatons. And bear in mind that the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima was 12 kilotons. It's unimaginably huge. And Oppenheimer's argument was no one in their right minds would use such a bomb, so why should we be developing it? And so Oppenheimer advised the US government not to proceed with the development of the hydrogen bomb, and in consequ consequence made some very influential enemies, including Edward Teller himself, uh, who'd never really liked Oppenheimer very much anyway, and including this man here. Uh, it looks like it should be pronounced Louis Strauss, but it's, he, he insisted on calling himself Louis Strauss. And Louis Strauss was head of the Atomic Energy Commission, and therefore in a position to do Oppenheimer's reputation a great deal of damage, which he did in 1954 by instituting a security hearing against Oppenheimer, basically accusing Oppenheimer of being an unfit person uh, to be in receipt of American military secrets. The, the judgment of this security hearing was that Oppenheimer was unfit, and therefore ha he had his security clearing uh, taken away from him, but they decided he, you know, he wasn't guilty of espionage and, and, and he was never officially suspected of espionage. Um, but he did have his security clearance taken away from him. And that utterly destroyed him. Uh, you can see pictures of him. He'd already lost an enormous amount of weight just heading... You know, imagine being responsible for developing the atomic bomb, and then imagine being responsible for tens of thousands of deaths at Hiroshima and then at Nagasaki. And you can see it in his face. His face is drawn, it's pale. He's, he, he looks emaciated. And then after 1954, after the security hearing, he lost even more weight and looked even iller. But a remarkable thing happened, which was at the end of 1954, the influential American journalist Ed Murrow decided to make a program about the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study, and he went to Princeton, recorded interviews with everybody that mattered, including Einstein and so on, went back and looked at the footage and realized it was all unusable um, for roughly the same reasons that Groves decided it was uh, pointless talking to, to Arthur Compton and so on, that you know, these, these people, although brilliant, weren't good at explaining themselves, with the exception of Oppenheimer. And so Ed Murrow went back to Princeton to, and he decided not to make a, a program about the Institute but to make a program about Oppenheimer. And, and, and if you watch his program, you can see Oppenheimer is at his best. He's utterly charming. He's smiling. He's beguiling. Um, Ed Murrow was obviously very taken. And the program revealed to the American audience, the American public, the best side of Oppenheimer. And overnight, after this program was shown, Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer's reputation was transformed from being, you know, a security risk and potentially, you know, a Soviet spy into one of the most charming, clever, witty uh, intellectuals in America. The second aspect of his reconciliation towards the end of his life, and you can see there this photograph, how skinny he looks, his, his clothes are just sort of hanging off him. Um, in 1960, he was invited to Japan um, 
and he was greeted with great dignity by, by uh, everybody in the Japanese government and ev uh, all the professors at the Japanese universities, uh, and it was acknowledged that he wasn't an enemy of Japan, uh, that he was a man uh, with a concern for truth, with a concern for peace. And then finally, the final reconciliation took place in 1964 when he was given the highest prize that a physicist can be given, the Fermi Prize. Um, it was supposed to be awarded to him uh, by JFK, uh, but on the day that it was announced that he would be receiving the prize from JFK in November 63, uh, Kennedy was assassinated. And so in 64, Oppenheimer was presented with this prize uh, by the newly installed President Johnson. And who should be there to congratulate him but Edward Teller? And there's this famous photograph. Oppenheimer is only 60 years old there. He looks more like 80 or 90 years old. But anyway, there's this famous photograph of Edward Teller coming up to, to greet Oppenheimer and congratulate him on uh, having this very prestigious prize. And Oppenheimer looking very uh, gracious. Uh, and his wife, Kitty, looking rather less gracious. Uh, in fact, Kitty looks at Teller as if, as if looks could kill, uh, Teller wouldn't have lived beyond that day. So Oppenheimer died in the new year of 1967 of cancer. One of his last words was to his friend uh, uh, Sam at the Institute of Advanced Study, Institute for Advanced Study. He said, Sam, don't smoke, which is pretty good advice, I think. And I'm going to leave, going to finish the lecture with this remark. He gave lots of popular lectures in the last decade of his life. And in one of them, in the summer of 1960, he was concerned to talk about himself and how he understood himself. And he said this, If I cannot be comforted by Vishnu's argument to Arjuna, this is in the Bhagavad Gita, it is become, it's because I am too much a Jew, much too much a Christian, much too much a European, far too much an American. For I believe in the meaningfulness of human history and of our role in it, and above all, of our responsibility to it. That seems to me a good place to end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a fantastic talk and a great tour de force. Uh, maybe we can ask a few questions sure. if that's agreeable to you. Yeah. So, uh, any questions you might want to ask? Bitte. Haben wir das Mikrofon da oder haben wir anders auch noch? Come chance. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I was very much surprised to hear that Oppenheimer had uh, twice in his life tried to kill uh, people. And uh, you said, okay, he was like insane in this period, but I'm wondering whether that is really a, a sufficient, um, I don't know, explanation or something, or whether that is an indication that uh, goes deeper into his uh, character and maybe could explain why he would be ready to embark on something like Manhattan Project, or what do you think? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last bit of your question. Um, well, whether that could be an indication, like if, he, if somewhere in his personality he is ready to kill people, that that made him fit for embarking on guiding something like Manhattan Project. Okay, so is your question something like this, that there might be a connection that I haven't explored between his murderous rage against Blackett and Ferguson in 1925-26 and his willingness to head a project that resulted in the deaths of tens of thousands of people? <sighs> mm. 
That, of course, is a really interesting question. I, I, I don't myself see a connection. And here's why. The way I see his attempted murder of Blackett and of Ferguson, it's, a, it's more like what the French call a, a crime of passion. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's overcome. He's overcome with jealousy for Blackett, for being so well regarded, for being such a good experimental physicist. And he's overcome with jealousy for Ferguson, not just because Ferguson has a girlfriend, but also because Ferguson has assimilated into the top levels of English society in a way that Oppenheimer never did. What's expressed there, I think, in both cases, I mean, it's not the only thing that's being expressed there, but it is being expressed, is jealousy. And he's overcome. He's, he's not thinking. He doesn't, really, he, he, he doesn't really want to see the deaths of Ferguson or Blackett. He can't control himself. But the decision to direct the Los Alamos laboratory, for better or for worse, is made in the cold light of reason. It's not an, it's not an impassioned moment of self-overcoming. It's not that he's... A, a drive has taken over his ability to think through the consequences of his actions. On the contrary, his decision to, to accept that job was made in the full awareness of what the consequences would be and deciding to do that. So, now as I say, he, you know, he, he was very regretful about the second bomb, about Nagasaki. And of course, you can't be responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of people at Hiroshima without it weighing very heavily on your conscience. But he was asked many times, do you regret developing the bomb and do you regret it being used in Hiroshima? And every time he said no. Without diminishing the seriousness of what had happened, he could still say, I would do that again. Why? Because because of the argument that Anton gave before my talk, that the consequences of not bringing about a quick surrender of the Japanese would be worse even than the deaths of those tens of thousands of people at Hiroshima. Now, the idea of making that calculation is, of course, appalling. Uh, but the point is, it is a calculation. It's not a moment of passion. So... I don't see, I, I don't see what's expressed in his, in his actions about Blackett, towards Blackett and Ferguson, I don't see as having very much kinship with what's being expressed in his directorship of the, of the laboratory. Do you think that's, I mean, come back if you... Okay, next question. Thank you. Uh, could you please tell us uh, something about how Oppenheimer and Einstein got along with each other. Did they, <laughs> did they talk? Did they cooperate? Did they uh, discuss responsibility and so on? Yeah, could, yeah, good. Um, I, Oppenheimer admired, of course, the early work of Einstein, the work of 1905 and, and, and the work of 1915. He had a deep admiration for the work that Einstein had done and for Einstein's paving the way for 20th century physics. However, he thought Einstein lost it, really, when Einstein refused to accept the consequences of quantum mechanics. And in those, those debates that Einstein had with Bohr and with Max Born, Oppenheimer's sympathies were with Born and Bohr. And he would actually say rather unkind things about Einstein. He would say that Einstein, you know, has spent too long on his own, that he's, you know, he's a, he's, he's a lost luminary. Um, and when Einstein died in the 50s, when did Einstein die? 55? 56. 56. 55. So, 55. 55. 
so when Einstein died in 55, Oppenheimer wrote an obituary of him, and it, it rather shocked Einstein's relations because it, uh, it, it expressed Oppenheimer's misgivings about the value of the work that Einstein had done in the last um, you know, 30 or 40 years of his life. Um, so, so the general picture, I guess, is, is one of ambivalence. He, he much admired uh, uh, the work on the photoelectric effect and, and, and the theory of relativity, but he, he thought Einstein had wasted his uh, talents on opposing uh, the indeterminacy of quantum mechanics. Or just, just a comment on that. You might be aware that one of the papers where he criticized quantum mechanics today is by far his most frequently quoted paper because yeah. it started my field, for example. <laughs> but that was long after Einstein's death. There's a question back there. In the fourth row, first, please. I was a bit surprised that General Groves has chosen Oppenheimer because he could make it clear. So, uh, naturally, it's a, it's a nice gift to speak clearly, but maybe you simplify the whole matter. There must have been other reasons why uh, General Groves selected finally Oppenheimer, and wasn't there an alternative? Uh, didn't Groves also think of Teller, for instance, or the other candidates? Or did he only simply say, and this was a bit my impression, he can speak clearly, he made it clear to me, so be the head of it. Yeah, I mean, um, well, those are the two reasons that Groves gives in his autobiography and that he gave, I mean, he was asked many times why he chose Oppenheimer, and he always said that. Um, you don't find it plausible be why? Why, why? I don't understand. It's too simple. Well, I would be a great choice as head of the laboratory. <laughs> uh, all right. What were the alternatives? Teller certainly wasn't an alternative. I mean, Teller had already revealed himself to be too difficult a man to be in charge of a division of Los Alamos, let alone in charge of the whole thing. Leo Szilard, Groves regarded much as J. Edgar Hoover regarded Oppenheimer. Groves, Groves, Groves you know, wanted Szilard uh, uh, in captivity. <laughs> he, 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 he seriously suggested that the security people get hold of Szilard and uh, put him out of action. Uh, Gro Groves was enormously distrustful of Szilard. The people who were considered, Arthur Compton was considered, uh, Ernest Lawrence, Harold Urey. Those were the people who were being considered, uh, Enrico Fermi. But Oppenheimer, as I said, he went, to, he went to discuss these things with all of those people. And he came away deeply disillusioned. Because, not only because they weren't good at explaining clearly what they were doing, that was, I mean, you, you make rather light of that, but that's terribly important. If you're going to be in charge of a project that cost $2 billion, it was the most, it, most expensive American research project ever, dwarfing any other uh, candidate. And Groves often said, look, he really wanted to get this job done because when, if he, Groves said, you know, look, if I'm called up to Capitol Hill and explain, and, and, and I'm asked, what, you know, so what have we got for our $2 billion? I want to say we've got some bombs for it, right? So that means that Groves has got to understand what's going on in the project. And if he's got somebody like Arthur Compton or Ernest Lawrence who can't explain what's going on, then that, that, for Groves, that's not a slight matter. That's centrally important. But the second aspect is equally important that these people weren't really interested in making a bomb. Didn't really interest Arthur Compton to make a bomb, or Harold Urey, or Ernest Lawrence. Oppenheimer was the one scientist that Groves met who A, understood the physics, B, could explain it, and C, actually wanted to produce a bomb. Until Oppenheimer took charge of... Um, Oppenheimer's uh, original title was Director of Rapid Rupture. 
<laughs> that was his original title. Um, and until then, the committee, the various committees that had been charged by the US government to investigate the possibility of a fission bomb, when they met, they never even used the word bomb. They were so coy about that's what they were doing that they wouldn't even use the word. And, and they really weren't very interested in making the bomb, and Oppenheimer was. So I think, I think you have to put the two reasons together, and then you understand why Groves was prepared to override. It wasn't just J. Edgar Hoover saying, look, this man is very dangerous. It was also a bunch of scientists saying, Oppenheimer's not an experimentalist. And also they were saying, he's not even the most distinguished man amongst us. He hasn't won the Nobel Prize. You know, so he was prepared to say to the scientist, I don't care whether he's won the Nobel Prize or not. And he was prepared to say to Edgar Hoover, I don't care whether you suspect him of being a communist or not. This is the man I want. And Groves in that, I think, revealed a kind of genius because Oppenheimer did turn out to be the perfect choice. And he got the job done. And everybody remembers, Hans Bater is particularly good on this, all the people at Los Alamos, what, one of the things they remember about Los Alamos was how brilliant Oppenheimer was as a leader. It turned out, against all the odds, that Groves was right, that Oppenheimer was a brilliant director of that laboratory. Because of it, it's, it's as if all his life up until then, in a curious kind of way, had been leading up to it. Because of his wide range of interests, there were all sorts of problems that had to be discussed at Los Alamos. So all sorts of scientific problems. So he had to meet with somebody who was working on plutonium. Then he had to meet with somebody who was working on uranium. Then he had to meet with somebody who was working on the trigger mechanism of the bomb. Then he had to discuss shape charges in implosion. And each person felt that Oppenheimer understood very quickly, almost instantaneously, what the problems were and how they could be solved. That was one thing. But then all the people in charge of all the infrastructure at Los Alamos, and as Los Alamos got bigger, you needed better roads, you needed uh, crash facilities, you needed more housing, you needed an efficient plumbing system, and so on and so on. And Oppenheimer also had to meet with people to discuss all that. And again, those people remember him as not only grasping the problem very quickly, but taking it seriously and suggesting good ways of solving the plumbing problem, the electricity problem, and so on. It turned out that he was the perfect choice. Maybe you mentioned it, but I didn't quite catch on what uh, Oppenheimer was suffering. It looked like cancer, but could it be that still he had such a long period to live on? And the second question which rose now, this Alamo, were the scientists there? Did they have the families there, or were they only uh, the Los scientists? Alamos. Yeah. Los Alamos, yes. Okay, good. Um, so the first question, yes, it was cancer. He died of cancer. Uh, directly attributed to his smoking. He's, he smoked an enormous amount. He smoked 60 a day. He, he, uh, he, was, he was a very heavy smoker. Um, and, 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 and when he was giving lectures, he smoked. He just smoked all the time. And he was a pretty heavy drinker, too. Um, his house at Princeton was called Olden Manor. Uh, and he and his wife both drank to excess. And, and, and at Princeton, they called it B Bourbon Manor uh, because there was so much drink available there. Um, so he, you know, he wasn't a healthy man. Um, the second part of your question about was that the families? Yeah. Um, not all of them. You have to remember, a lot of the scientists who worked at Los Alamos were young men. So think about Richard Feynman. Feynman worked at Los Alamos. He'd just completed his PhD, and as a young man, he was sent to Los Alamos, and he, he was actually put in charge of a division. Um, he was only 23. How old was Feynman? You know, he was a young man. So the, yeah. and, and many of the scientists working at Los Alamos were young man, men. Uh, some of them hadn't even finished their PhDs, but they were young, single men. Now, the leaders, people like Teller, Beta, Oppenheimer, um, Bob Serber when he was there, these people did have wives and some of them had families and that's why you know, they had to set up a creche and, and, and so on and so on. They provided, so they had several levels of accommodation at Los Alamos, none of it very grand. Um, the grandest you got was having your own bathtub and you had your own bathtub if you, A, you had a senior position and B, you had a family. Um, and there was a row of houses called Bathtub Alley in, in, in Los Alamos that were reserved for the uh, prominent people um, who had their own families. Uh, everyone, else, everyone else basically uh, lived in a dorm. You know. 
Can so it's, it was a mixture of lifestyles. Can I ask you a small question? I mean, I, I have the understanding that the people who joined the project didn't know immediately what they were working on. Uh, my question more is, is, are there any people who refused to work on it as soon as they knew what they were work, really working on? Yeah, the most striking example of that is Isidore Rabi, who mm -hmm. refused. Okay. Um, yeah. Oppenheimer really wanted Rabi. At and others? How many were there? I mean, was it this How many who refused? A very small number? Very yeah. small number, yeah. Very small number. Yeah. Um, von Neumann refused to give his total. Uh, okay. But von Neumann was so clever, he didn't need to. Von Neumann uh, negotiated a position where he... Because von Neumann was also helping the Admiralty. He was also helping uh, the Marines. He, he, von Neumann was... And, and also developing the science of cybernetics. And so, von, mm -hmm. von Neumann was extraordinarily intelligent. And he negotiated this position where he would come to Los Alamos uh, you know, every few months, spend a couple of days there, solve the problems that people weren't solving, and then go back uh, to the East Coast. And so von Neumann uh, just spent a couple of days there. Israel Rabi refused to, 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 to join the project at all because he didn't think it would work. And he thought that he could make a greater contribution to the war effort uh, by working on radar, which is what he, he spent the war doing. Um, so there were a few people, not very many. But with regard... To, did they know what they were doing? Did they know what, that what they were doing was making a bomb? Well, the people who were char in charge of the divisions did. Uh, and Oppenheim, the argument Oppenheimer used to get, for example, Hans Bethe to commit to, to, to going was, look, we've got to get this bomb done because otherwise Heisenberg and the Germans uh, will, 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 will make a bomb and then it's all over. Um, and he used that argument and people were accept most of the people accepted that argument um, there was a famous example of a scientist accepting uh, the offer to come to Los Alamos and then leaving after a few days, which is Edward Condon. Uh, mm -hmm. He couldn't cope with the, uh, uh, with the security arrangements and fell out with General Groves and so left the project. Um, but apart from that, most of the people in charge of, of the various divisions knew what they were doing. It's true that some of the younger people didn't, and especially it grew and grew and grew. I mean, their original vision was to get 20 scientists there working on the problems of fission. By the end of the war, there were tens of thousands of people in Los Alamos. That's and good. most of them weren't scientists. Most, most of them were uh, uh, people working for the army. And they were, they were under Groves' uh, command, and they were told only what they needed to know. Mm, we should slowly come to an end. There's a question back there. Well, two questions, yes. Yeah, certain, like, who else wants to, uh, we should slowly come to an end. One. Okay. Yes. Um, maybe first we I can, must say maybe we should pull a few questions together or something like that. Sorry? Huh? Maybe we should pull a few questions together. Oh, okay, yeah. That, yeah. that sure. makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. I must say I'm not here because of Oppenheim. I'm here because of Wittgenstein. Even when it was very, very interesting uh, what you told us about Oppenheimer, uh, I would, have, I would like to know a little bit more about his political ambitions of his last 20 years. But I, first I want to thank you very, very much about uh, your book, uh, The Duty of Genius. Uh, I don't remember a book in my life who, whose uh, content gave me, gave me a richer, uh, more rich uh, in information than, than your book about Wittgenstein. Thank you and very my much. question is now. Thank you. Perhaps another book is the autobiography of Charlie Chaplin. Uh, but um, my question is now, um, as a poor little hobby philosopher, to a professor of philosophy, what you think is the remaining achievement, the, the lesson uh, Wittgenstein has to give us also for the 21st century uh, what do we still have to learn uh, from Wittgenstein uh, in the 21st century uh, even when the most impressive sentence uh, is from the for me is from the Tractatus and that is uh, it is not how the world uh, not how the world is the mystery but that it is is the mystery. This is the most impressive sentence, even when I think uh, his uh, more important work is the philosophical investigations. But my question, 
what do we have to learn still, you think, from Wittgenstein in, in the 21st century? Okay, shall, I, shall I address that? We, of the, pro of we the probably wouldn't make sense. Uh, Anton, I don't think it makes sense to pull that with. because I ask whether somebody else has a similar oh, okay. question. Has anyone else a similar question on philosophically, uh, the philosophical side? So maybe we put that together, da hinten, da ganz hinten. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't make sense to mix the philosophy and the Oppenheimer question. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah, but maybe, yeah. Bitte, da ist noch eine Frage auch zur Philosophie, Wittgensteins, bitte. Thank you, well, it has, it has um, a relationship with what the gentleman over there was saying. Um, after having done such an extensive work on three, three uh, people, like Wittgenstein, Bertrand Russell, and Oppenheimer, when you finished the job and you closed the book or your, you know, your computer, what was the lesson for you? Perhaps it, it has, what was the, or if you have to drop a word of admiration for Oppenheimer, um, Sorry, I, 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 I missed, I, I, I got the gist of your first bit and then yes, a couple of it, crucial it, words were missing from the... Yeah, in relation to what the gentleman over there yeah. was saying about Wittgenstein, um, when, you, when you finished the job on, on, on Oppenheimer, what was the lesson for you? I'm not okay. referring to any personal comment. It's just mm. when you finish something, you say, oh, what, what, um, what was, if you had to drop a word of admiration for that? A drop a, a word of? A word of admira, ad, admiration. Okay. Now, what would, what would it be like? What would you say? What was, what, um, so that's a joint question because uh, this lady related it to all three books. What yeah. is your, what is your, and this is similar to this question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, let me deal with this question first. What, because I have a fairly stable view on that, um, what do I think Wittgenstein's greatest legacy for us in the 21st century is? I think it's from his later work, and I think it's, it's a non-technical thing, so I don't think it's, it's, it's to do with any of the technicalities of logical form or of uh, uh, the, the theory of language or of mathematics or any of that. I think in Wittgenstein's later work, he articulates something which is terribly important and which I think is increasingly important in our times, which is the opposition to what is called scientism. Now, scientism is the view that if we lack a scientific theory of something, we lack any understanding of it at all. And Wittgenstein, in his later work, was concerned to describe philosophy and to insist that philosophy is not and cannot be a science, that it's after a different kind of understanding. And so if you ask me, what is his greatest legacy? It's the description of that other kind of understanding and the insistence on its importance and on its generality. So it's the understanding we have of a poem, it's the understanding we have of a piece of music, uh, uh, of philosophy, of each other. When we understand a person, it's not because we have a scientific theory of them. It's another kind of understanding. And actually, and this ties in now with, with uh, the second question, I think there's a similar lesson to be learned from Oppenheimer, actually, because Oppenheimer, towards the end of his life, first of all, Oppenheimer kept alive in a way that's very rare now an interest in non-scientific things as a scientist. So he kept alive a keen interest in philosophy, in Hinduism, in literature, in poetry, and he, he knew the latest developments in all those fields. And he, like Wittgenstein, would insist that what's required to understand ourselves can't be given by science alone. In the last lectures that he gave towards the end of his life, Oppenheimer was very keen on taking an idea from Niels Bohr. I said that Niels Bohr was the man he admired more than any other. And Niels Bohr had this notion of complementarity. So that the, the, it begins with the idea that to look at, let's say, a photon or an electron as a wave and as a particle, Bohr says these are... It's not, they're not in competition with each other. They are complementary ways of looking at the reality. And Bohr says it's terribly, insist it's terribly important that they're inconsistent and yet both necessary. They, they complement each other. And Oppenheimer, in, in, in the last lectures he gave towards the end of his life, 
took that idea and used it for the understanding we have of one another and of history and of politics, saying, look, we, we need to accept that there isn't a single way of looking at ourselves and of each other and of our history. We have to be open to inconsistent but complementary ways of understanding ourselves. And, and for Oppenheimer and for Wittgenstein, that is both a way of opposing dogmatism. And I think maybe that is the lesson. So you asked me, you know, what would be the lesson from all three biographies? I guess in two words it would be avoid dogmatism. Okay, maybe we pull together now really the last questions. There was one question here. Da war eine und wo noch? Die zwei. Bitte, ganz egal, wo Sie früher hinkommen. And let's pull them together because I think we might, yeah. Um, I'm just wondering how somebody as intelligent as Oppenheimer could have made the big mistake that he made, that is, um, helping to produce a bomb and then regretting it later. And I'm wondering if there's any documentation at all about uh, his discussions with Groves. Um, after all, the Pro Manhattan Project was started under the Roosevelt administration. The bomb was dropped in the Truman administration. So you've got a shift in, in world views, a uh, very big one. Is it possible that um, Oppenheimer believed somehow and that this was reinforced by the Roosevelt administration, that he was producing a deterrent rather to uh, the Heisenberg uh, bomb? The Americans knew that the Germans were producing it. Is it possible that he was planning on on, on, on making a bomb as a deterrent and not really as something that would actually be dropped not only once but twice can we, can during we, maybe a we very can, different political can, atmosphere. Yeah, sure. Can we really t get the other question also sure, and then sure. we get... There's a last question back there and then we should... Oder gibt es noch eine andere Frage? Da war nur eine Frage oder nicht? Nein? Lise Meitner. Was she in contact with Oppenheimer? Good. Can I take that one first? Because that one's easier. Um, no. <laughs> um, Meitner, you, you, you know about Meitner. Uh, Meitner wanted nothing to do with bomb making or you know, the application of, of, of fission. She was in no way involved in the Manhattan Project. And as far as I know, I stand to be corrected on this, but as far as I'm aware, there was no contact whatsoever, either personal contact or contact by letter or whatever, no contact between Meitner and Oppenheimer ever. Oppenheimer knew the story about Meitner and Otto Frisch and so on. He knew that story well. He'd been told that story by uh, Niels Bohr, and he later got to know Otto Frisch quite well. Uh, and Otto Frisch came to Los Alamos. Uh, Lisa Meitner never did, and uh, I don't think Meitner had anything to do with Oppenheimer, and I don't think Meitner wanted anything to do with Oppenheimer or, or the project. Now, this question, which is actually a bundle of questions. Um, so, the, the first, you refer to this as, as, as Oppenheimer's mistake. O Oppenheimer... Oppenheimer didn't regret the bomb. I mean, as I say, he was asked several times, do you regret making the bomb? And do you regret its use at Hiroshima? And his answer was always, no, I don't. It weighed very, very heavily on him, and he was concerned to, to, to do what he could to use the power of atomic energy for peaceful purposes and to do whatever he could to avoid any further use of atomic bombs uh, uh, in, the, in, in the future. You know that famous meeting with Truman um, after the war where Truman says, 
Mr. President, I feel I have blood on my hands. And Truman gave him a handkerchief and said, well, why don't you wipe them? And then Truman was very dismissive of Oppenheimer. He was appalled at Oppenheimer. He, he, said, he, 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 uh, he said to uh, his aides after that meeting, don't ever bring that crybaby scientist here again. Truman uh, wanted nothing to do with Oppenheimer, and he thought that Oppenheimer was, was uh, laying credit for the decision, whereas Truman's view was, look, the buck stops with me. It was my decision to, uh, to drop the bomb, uh, and, uh, and it wasn't Oppenheimer's, and, and the blood isn't on Oppenheimer's hands, it's on my hand. But the point about that story is that it's often told as if it expresses regret. Oppenheimer wasn't expressing regret. He wasn't saying he wished it had never happened. He was saying that now he had blood on his hands and he wanted to be involved. What Oppenheimer was really saying was he wanted to be involved in the decision-making with regard to the bomb because he felt, whatever Truman felt, Oppenheimer felt that he had blood on his hands and that you know, uh, he was involved uh, whether he liked it or not. And he opposed the second, the, the second bomb. Now, your second question about... Roosevelt versus Truman, was it possible that Oppenheimer thought he was involved in creating a deterrent rather than a, a weapon to be used? Well, there is a record on that, and it, it doesn't support that. Uh, um, there were a group of scientists, after the Trinity test, a group of scientists wanted to avoid... They, they had seen for themselves the awe-inspiring power of an atomic explosion the heat that it generated, the power that it generated. They didn't know much about radiation poisoning at that time, but they knew that this was going to kill an awful lot of people. And a lot of them wanted to avoid that, and particularly the group led by Leo Zillard at Chicago wanted to avoid it. And Leo Zillard got together a, a, a memo signed by most of the scientists at Chicago, which they then sent to Los Alamos. So we're now dealing with the period after the Trinity test, but before the Hiroshima bomb. So end of July, beginning of August, 1945. Zillard sent that memo to Los Alamos asking people to sign it. Oppenheimer urged people not to sign it. And Oppenheimer was a member of the various committees that advised the president on the bomb, including the target committee. So Oppenheimer was actually in the committee that selected Hiroshima as the target. Yeah. Um, Groves, I don't know whether you know this, but, but Groves, the top of Groves' list was Kyoto. And uh, Stimson and Oppenheimer between them persuaded Groves to put Hiroshima at the top of the list because they couldn't bear the thought of destroying a site as historically and religiously important as, as, as Kyoto. And also in those committee meetings, and, and these records have now been released, and, and one can read them, and they make dispiriting reading for anybody who wants to present Oppenheimer as a kind of um, opponent of, of using the, the, the bomb, because actually Oppenheimer argues directly in those meetings for dropping the bomb on a population. And his reason for that, it's to do with Niels Bohr's vision. Niels Bohr's vision was this could be the best thing that ever happened to humankind, but because it can frighten them into international cooperation, but what's required to produce that effect is actually using it. So Oppenheimer supported using the bomb on a civilian population, I'm afraid. Okay, so maybe we stop here. Thank you very much again for your great talk and for your endurance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.